Okay, now it's time for us to get down into the really interesting part of hematology. Um, we're going to learn about the individual cells, um, especially we're going to spend a lot of time on white blood cells, um, but we're going to learn about the individual cells that make up um, all these things that we're going to be studying for hematology. So let's begin. All right, so like I said, we're starting with white blood cells. These are also called leukocytes, leukocytes. Leuco means white, site means cell, so these are white blood cells. Um, and they get their name primarily from when we spin the sample down and we get that, that buffy coat layer in between the erythrocyte layer and the plasma layer. Um, so it kind of looks like a white stripe in that area. Uh, the function of our white blood cells are to control inflammation um, and to control bacterial infections also to provide immunity. And we have two different kinds of immunity that we see with the white blood cells. We have sort of our first line of immunity with our granulocytes, neutrophils, basophils, and eosinophils. Those guys are the kind of the first ones to attack, and they're part of the innate um, or nonspecific immune system. If you'll remember back to veterinary diseases, um, the innate or nonspecific immune system basically attacks anything that looks out of place. Um, and then we have the cellular immunity, which is primarily run by um, the T lymphocytes, and the humoral immunity, which is run by the B lymphocytes, and those are responsible for kind of learning over time what types of organisms or what types of invaders are normal versus abnormal, and then is able to respond to those invaders more quickly over time. Um, and then our monocytes are more chronic inflammation. We'll talk more about those guys later. Um, some of the other functions of leukocytes are to help um, enhance blood clotting and then to help to destroy clots once we have uh, used them up, once they are no longer needed, and then also to prevent unwanted clots. So there's a lot of management of clotting of blood that happens with white blood cells in addition to managing the immune system. So we're going to start off talking about granulocytes, and these are the white blood cells that have granules in the cytoplasm. That's where they get their name. Um, and there are three types here. Um, we can see all the way over to the right the neutrophil, in the middle there the eosinophil, and then on the left the basophil. And um, I found these little cartoons um, both charming and also helpful. Uh, you can see that they have you know, kind of the shapes of the nucleus and the gray within them, and then the different colors of the granules. So um, I found that, I don't know, I just like them, little cute little guys, um, to help us, you know, remember the different types of granulocytes that we see. I also like that the basophil has a little histamine, should also have a little heparin coming off of his uh, little appendage there, because um, I find it hard to remember sometimes what basophils do, because we don't see them very often. Um, so it's nice that he's helping us out by telling us he's got histamine in there. Now, to be a little more realistic, we need to look at these cells um, under the microscope. And uh, again, here are three types, and, and uh, here on the left we have a neutrophil. Those neutrophil granules are um, more neutral in color, which is where they get their name. They have that multi-lobed, um, usually eosinophilic to basophilic staining nucleus. Then in the center we have the basophil with those dark purple basophilic staining granules, another multi-lobed nucleus. And then finally, all the way to the right, we have the eosinophil with a multi-lobe nucleus and then pink or eosinophilic staining granules. And you can see all those distinct granules within those three types of cells, um, which are characteristic of our granulocytes. And then we have our last two, uh, which fall into the category of A granulocytes, which means no granules in the cytoplasm. And our two, set, two types here are on the left, we have uh, lymphocytes, and then on the right, we have monocytes. And you can see, um, you know, the cytoplasm is distinctly without granules. Uh, the monocytes, you'll see in so, sort of some open areas, some paler uh, circles that are um, vacuoles, they're not granules. Um, those areas that are not staining are those little vacuoles.
So we're going to talk specifically about each type of white blood cell, um, just to kind of break it down a little bit more. So neutrophils are our most common cell in the dog and the cat. And we're going to start out look at learning dog and cat, and then as the semester goes on, we're going to bring in our different species. And it's going to be important that we understand how all those species relate as compared to the dog and the cat, because that's where we're starting at right now as sort of, quote, normal. Um, we also call these uh, cells seg segs for segmented nuclei or PMNs for polymorphic nucleus, which means the nucleus has lots of different shapes. Um, I generally will only use PMN if I'm looking at a cytology and not a blood smear. Um, pretty much stick to the neutrophil nomenclature for blood smears. So these granules that are inside the neutrophil are going to be responsible for helping to break down or lyse bacteria. And again, these neutrophils are our first line of defense. They can tell normal versus abnormal cells most of the time. And when they come across a cell or um, you know, a, a, a virus or something that shouldn't be in the bloodstream, they are going to engulf it via phagocytosis and then use the granules to help break down that structure, whatever it happens to be, that shouldn't be in there. Here's a couple other images of neutrophils. And again, we have that multi-lobed nucleus um, and then sort of not super pink, not super blue staining granules within. So I mentioned that neutrophils are responsible for phagocytosis. Um, and that eating of, um, eating of uh, primarily solid material is uh, what phagocytosis is. And there's lots of different cells that participate in phagocytosis, but that's the main way that neutrophils uh, take care of abnormal structures within the bloodstream. Here's some uh, images here you can see on the left is sort of a cartoon of uh, a neutrophil that is engulfing a bacteria and then those granules within the bacteria or excuse me the granules within the neutrophil kind of destroy the bacteria um, and in some cases the neutrophil is damaged and destroyed as well on the right side we have an image of um, some neutrophils you can see um, we have three neutrophils on the left side of the image that are kind of lined up and that one in the middle with the arrow pointing to it has little bacteria inside, and the, those have all been phagocytized. That bacteria has been phagocytized by the neutrophils. Neutrophils also participate in something called pinocytosis, which is um, ingesting intracellular fluids and its contents. And so it's basically things that are not solid or things that are dissolved into the, the fluid um, of the plasma or dissolved into the fluid of the extracellular um, uh, spaces. And it's essentially like phagocytosis, it's just not large solid particles, it's things that are suspended in solution. Neutrophils also hold on to bacterial toxins, um, and these toxins are generally going to be held inside the cell until that cell dies. Um, and then unfortunately the, the toxins can be released into the bloodstream if the cell dies while still in the bloodstream. However, it can get rid of the toxins um, in, in the intestines, the lungs, and the kidneys if the neutrophils move into those areas. Um, so they're going to phagocytize or penocytize toxins as that first line of um, defense against foreign invaders and then try and get rid of those toxins in um, the lungs, the intestines, and the kidneys. So very, very important cell. It's good that there are our primary cell in our patients uh, that are dogs and cats because they're going to be um, doing a lot of the heavy lifting when it comes to um, defending the body against foreign bacteria, viruses, and fungal elements that are trying to get into the body. So our next 
granulocytes, the eosinophil, and I personally think this is the most beautiful of all of the leukocytes. Um, I'm very, very partial to uh, eosinophils, especially the equine and the feline eosinophils. I just think they're beautiful, and I get super excited when I see them. Um, so the eosinophil will have eosinophilic granules. That means those granules are going to stain very bright pink or orange in most Difquick um, or right games in the stains, which is the kind that we tend to use as the Difquick. Um, and so they'll be very uh, identifiable in most situations, very noticeable cell because of those bright pink granules. The nucleus will be multi-lobed, um, usually not as many lobes as the um, neutrophil will have, uh, oftentimes just two. But um, again, that characteristic granule is what you're going to be seeing. So mostly eosinophils are going to be in tissues, um, especially the lining of the intestinal tract, the respiratory tract, and the skin. Um, we have a much lower number of eosinophils circulating in the bloodstream, which is why we won't see as many of them on a percentage basis as we do the neutrophils. So eosinophils are responsible for engulfing bacteria. Again, just like neutrophils, they are very important in phagocytosis of abnormal uh, components that have entered the body. Um, they are helping to control inflammation by releasing antihistamine. So one of the things that happens is that eosinophils are called to an area where an allergic response is occurring. So a for instance would be if um, a patient is allergic to a particular kind of pollen that is uh, sitting on the skin. Um, the, there's a type of cell called a mast cell that's in the skin that will release histamine. And upon releasing histamine, that patient's, uh, patient will experience some redness and some swelling in that area, maybe a hive or a local area of inflammation, and will be very itchy. And when that histamine is in the area, um, remember most of our eosinophils are hanging out in the tissues of the skin, the intestinal tract, and the respiratory tract. The ones in the skin will all be called to that area where that histamine has been released, and then they'll release their antihistamine in an effort to kind of control that inflammation and control that itching. So a lot of times we will see patients with allergies with increased numbers of eosinophils in their circulation because they need more eosinophils to calm down all the histamine that's being released. Eosinophils are also going to help break down clots. Um, they have this compound called profibrinolysin, and this is going to help to break down the fibrinogen that develops um, with part of our coagulation cascade. So they're going to help to break down clots typically after those clots are no longer useful or to prevent clots from forming when they shouldn't be forming. Um, so that's part of the kind of uh, breakdown process after clots are no longer needed. And then finally, the least uh, numerous type of granulocyte in the canine and the feline is the basophil. And really, you're almost never going to see these, in, um, especially in the feline, and in the canine, you'll see them pretty rarely. Their characteristic granules are going to generally stain very basophilic or, you know, kind of a dark blue or purple. Um, they are going to be more plentiful in other species. However, um, in the dog and the cat, we don't see them very often. We can see them more often in the canine with heartworm disease. And so if you have a patient that has elevated basophils, um, that's something that you're going to want to double check. Um, or at least mention it to your DVM. Hey, I'm seeing lots of basophils here. Uh, do we have a current heartworm test on this dog? Um, so that would be that would be a really helpful thing to know. Um, again, this little guy has the histamine um, molecule drawn off to his or his right, your left, on the screen. Um, just to remind us that basophils are important um, in releasing histamine. So they're going to be one of the ones releasing histamine, calling those eosinophils to an area um, for the eosinophils to release their antihistamine.
Here's a couple of images. I apologize that one on the left is not coming through as nicely as I expected. The one on the right looks really great though, and that's sort of your classic um, basophil. Lots of deep purple granules. Sometimes it's difficult to see the nucleus, which will be multi-lobed, um, much like the neutrophil and the eosinophil. Um, sometimes it's hard to see it through all those deep purple granules. Feline basophil, here's an image of one, and this almost looks like it doesn't have a lot of granules in it. Um, didn't stain perfectly, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to have that dark um, basophilic cytoplasm and then the multi-lobe nu nucleus. And so this, this cell, you know, if I saw this cell all by itself, I would need to go scanning the slide um, to look for what the neutrophils look like. Um, because this almost looks like it could be a toxic neutrophil. Because remember, we see um, basophilic cytoplasm in toxic neutrophils. So I'd have to see some of these close, close up. But this is a feline basophil. So what do the basophils do? Um, well, they release histamine and heparin. Um, the histamine is going to uh, induce inflammation. And so remember, again, what our eosinophils do, they have antihistamine to reduce inflammation. So basophils and eosinophils oftentimes will both elevate at the same time, um, especially if we have an allergic response or a parasite um, happening. That's when we'll see eosinophils and basophils increase in numbers. Um, and then they're also going to release heparin from their granules to help prevent blood from clotting. Um, you know, from time to time, uh, we can have clots and little clumps of platelets start to form up, and uh, the basophils help to keep that in check and keep that under control because we don't want um, blood clots forming unless we really need them to. So our next type of cell is monocyte, and a monocyte is an agranulocyte. So this is a cell that does not have granules. Um, monocytes are going to spend more time in the tissue than in the bloodstream. Um, and when they move into the tissues, they're actually called macrophages. Uh, the characteristic um, characteristics of monocytes are they're going to be a big phag phagocytic cell and they generally are going to destroy what the neutrophils can't. And so they are part of the innate immune system. They are part of that first line of defense, but generally they don't increase in number until you know, whatever is causing the problem has been around for a while. And so we do see more monocytes with more chronic inflammation, um, a chronic infection than we do with elevations in neutrophils. So neutrophils will increase first. If the inciting problem hangs around for a while, then our monocytes will come in and finish up the job that the neutrophils might not be able to complete on their own. Um, so if we're seeing lots of monocytes in a patient's bloodstream um, on, on their blood smear, we might be concerned about chronic or long-term infection or inflammation in that patient. Here are some additional pictures of monocytes. So they are generally going to have a nucleus that is sort of bean-shaped or maybe indented. Um, and then the characteristic cytoplasmic um, appearance of these guys is sort of a basophilic cytoplasmum with these big holes in it. And those holes are vacuoles. Um, and they don't stain. They're, they look like, you know, kind of little holes punched in the cytoplasm. A couple other pictures, again, we have that indented sort of C-shaped or maybe like a bean-shaped nucleus, um, a basophilic cytoplasm with no granules but with open space vacuoles.
Monocytes are the largest of all the white blood cells. They're going to help to, um, you know, add another layer of immunity. Um, again, they are coming up behind the neutrophils in order to, um, you know, kind of do the second tier cleanup. Um, they are phagocytic cells, so they are eating up bacteria, fungi, and protozoa, bacteria as well, uh, excuse me, viruses as well. They also function um, as penocytic cells, so they're removing liquids um, that will be involved in the inflammatory process. They help to stimulate clotting factors and um, break down clots as well. So they help to stimulate coagulation and then also fibrinolysis or breaking down of clots. So they help in that whole process. And then they also um, provide a very excellent scavenger role. So any dead, dying, damaged cells are going to be removed by monocytes. So our next cell is the lymphocyte, and lymphocytes are part of the immune system that is going to be very much um, specific. Um, this part of the immune system targets particular antigens, particular types of viruses, bacteria, fungi, pollens, what have you, um, and the reason they target is because they have a period of maturation in which they learn basically what types of things, um, what types of abnormal things have entered the body. And they create little um, antibodies or sensors, if you will, to identify these abnormal invaders and then uh, stimulate the uh, production of more antibodies or the production of T cells that uh, are a type of lymphocyte that will kill those abnormal invaders that have come in. Lymphocytes are the smallest of all of the uh, white blood cells in general um, for most of our patients. You can see in the canine and the feline, the nucleus of the lymphocyte tends to be about the same size as the red blood cell. In the bovine especially, we get these weird, um, you know, sort of reactive looking lymphocytes, atypical lymphocytes. They're quite a bit larger, equine are a little bit larger. And then down at the bottom we have, on the left, we have a reactive lymphocyte with a really dark uh, cytoplasm, and then every once in a while we'll get a few lymphocytes that have granules in them, but typically um, lymphocytes will fall under the category of a granulocyte or no granules. Here's a nice picture of a lymphocyte floating in a sea of red blood cells, and you can see again that nucleus should be about the same size as the red blood cells. Here are some larger lymphocytes. These are starting to get, you know, they're still considered relatively normal, but they're starting to get a little bit big um, and a little bit dicey looking. And then sometimes we might see these really large lymphocytes that have a lot more cytoplasm and then we typically see them having, um, and these are oftentimes their reactive or atypical lymphocytes that uh, might mean abnormalities happening within the bone marrow. So there are two types of lymphocytes. We have T cells. These are usually really long-lived cells. They mature in the thymus, which is where they get their T name. Um, and they are involved in the cell medi mediated immunity. So they really learn how, um, you know, how the body is functioning and how the immune system fu is functioning and what um, antigens are especially dangerous and need to be removed. B cells are our antibody producing cells. These guys mature the bone marrow. And they don't live very long, um, but they are the ones that primarily are creating the antibodies that will target the abnormal structures that come into the, um, the body and enter the bloodstream.
So lymphocytes function um, as, again, the part of the humoral and the cellular mediated immune system. Um, T cells are going to attach to invading antigens and destroy them. Um, and especially the T killer cells will be doing that. B cells are going to be producing immunoglobulins, which are another term for antibodies. And antibodies are made against a very specific antigen. And they're going to either, those antibodies will either coat that antigen completely, and that will kind of mark it for removal from different phagocytic cells or from a T cell, or um, it will bind with a, um, an antigen directly on the surface of the lymphocyte B cell and that will target it for removal as well. Um, if we have an infection and if our um, lymphocytes are simulated and are producing lots of antibodies, they can be called reactive lymphocytes. And what they will look like, you won't be able to see the antibodies. Those are, are submicroscopic. Those are molecular. But what they'll look like on the screen is a very dark blue cytoplasm, a little bit more cytoplasm than a neutrophil, or excuse me, a lymphocyte generally has. Um, it'll be really dark blue. So this image here on the slide, this is a reactive lymphocyte. This is a lymphocyte that is actively producing antibodies. Very often these cells will have a little area of lighter cytoplasm right next to the nucleus. So if you look just to the left of the purple nucleus in the blue cytoplasm, you'll see just a lighter area there. That's called a ghosting area. And uh, that's really common when we have cells that are actively producing antibodies. So here are our canine white blood cells. Um, we have a neutrophil up in the upper left, and we can see that it's a granulocyte. It has very neutral or light pink staining granules, and then we have this uh, basophilic nucleus that has multiple lobes. On the just below the neutrophil, we have the eosinophil, and these are the the large pink or eosinophilic staining granules with the multi-lobed basophilic nucleus. And then below that, we have um, a basophil. This is actually from our feline collection, a feline basophil. Um, and this is a, a cell that has um, basophilic granules and a multi-lobed nucleus. Up at the top right, we have a lymphocyte with a kind of circular, dark um, nucleus with just a pale rim of blue cytoplasm around. That's our normal sort of relaxed lymphocyte, not reactive, not making these uh, antibodies. Um, and then we have a monocyte. Um, that's the next one down. You can see that's an indented nucleus, kind of a C-shape with a basophilic um, cytoplasm without granules, maybe a couple of vacuoles in there. And then we've got platelets. And at the bottom, we've got platelets that are um, different sizes. And this is these are feline as well. Um, and that's a characteristic of, of cat platelets. They tend to be different sizes and shapes. Um, and the word for that is pleomorphic. And here's some uh, feline, uh, additional feline white blood cells. We've got a neutrophil um, followed by the eosinophil below it and the basophil on the bottom. Really good granules on that basophil. And then a lymphocyte, a monocyte, and then platelets. Again, different sizes, cat platelets.
So we're going to talk a little bit about red blood cells now, erythrocytes. Um, and here's a couple of different images. So the image in the middle is the one that we see when we look through the microscope. And we see these, um, they should be kind of a, a pinkish color. Um, and they sort of look like donuts. They've got little holes in the middle. And that's that uh, area of central pallor. And the reason they have that area of central pallor is because the shape of the red blood cell is actually sort of indented. Up in the, the image on the left, that's an electron photomicrograph of uh, red blood cells. And you can kind of see their shape a little bit more. Um, and I'll bring to class a, a model of sorts of a red blood cell that you can get your hands on and get a real feel for that shape. And then on the right side of the screen, you can see that the red blood cell has this biconcave disc shape. And again, it's a lot like a donut, um, but a donut without a complete hole in the center. And the reason it has this, this shape or the advantage of having this shape is that it allows the membrane to be very flexible and to be able to move in and out and squeeze and squish and change its shape a little bit when it gets down into these capillaries that are very, very small. And, uh, you know, across, um, you know, the size of a canine red blood cell all the way across is about seven microns. Um, but that's, you know, still maybe a little bit uh, wider than the smallest capillaries that go through some of the organs and, and skin uh, that are needed to receive the oxygen that these red blood cells are carrying. So the ability for that red blood cell to kind of squish and fold and, and squash into teeny um, narrow capillaries is really an important advantage of this type of shape of the red blood cells in the dogs and the cats. So in dogs and cats, we generally will have um, a size of red blood cell ranging from 5.8 micrometers in the cat to 7 micrometers in the dog. Um, and basically what that means is that cat red blood cells are slightly smaller than dog red blood cells. If you were to put them side by side, you could really tell the difference. Um, one on top of the or one right next to the other. It's a really difficult thing to do, um, but you can kind of get an, an idea from these images on the screen that the dog red blood cells are generally going to be a little bit bigger than cat red blood cells. Cat red blood cells also will not have as much central pallor as dogs will, um, again, generally due to their smaller size. Doesn't matter what kind of red blood cell we're talking about, though, they are all responsible for oxygen transport. And the primary function of these red blood cells is carrying hemoglobin, which is a protein molecule that attaches itself to oxygen and carries that oxygen to the different organs and tissues that the red blood cells are traveling to, offloads that oxygen to those cells, picks up carbon dioxide waste product, and then returns that carbon dioxide eventually to the lungs where it's released as our patients exhale and more oxygen is picked up as they inhale. So when we talk about red blood cells, we are often going to talk about their size and their shape and their color. And so let's start off talking about size. So normal red blood cells, um, let's just pick a dog, are going to be roughly 7 micrometers. And if you have a microscope that has a nice little um, uh, measuring guide on it, you can, uh, you can actually measure them. Otherwise, it does take time and um, looking at a lot of smears to get used to the appropriate size of the red blood cells. You can start to um, compare, though, to your... Um, white blood cell size as um, comparison to determine the appropriate size for your red blood cells. So here on the upper left, we have our normal size red blood cells in the dog. Um, the image to the right of that, still at the top, um, these are cells that are too small. These are microcytic, cells that are smaller than they should be, red blood cells that are smaller than they should be. And then I'm just going to go directly below the microcytic. Um, and then we have macrocytic. And so these are cells that are larger than they should be. Now, it, you'll notice in the microcytic and the macrocytic images 
that you're actually seeing variation in size, difference in size. And that is also seen in the image on the lower left. Um, and that's called anisocytosis. And so you'll, you'll generally want to, when you're classifying your cells, classify them as the most common type. And so if most of the cells are smaller than they should be, then that is a microcytic red blood cell population. If most of the cells are larger than they should be, then that is a macrocytic red blood cell population. More often than not, what you're going to see, though, is anisocytosis, or variation in cell size. And this is a really, really important word to know and remember and continue to use when you see changes and variation in the cell size. Um, that image is, um, you can see there's some really big red blood cells, those are represented by the A's with the arrows, and some really small red blood cells, those are represented by the B's with the arrows, and you can compare those to the size of the neutrophils, there are three neutrophils in that image. Um, and you can see some of them are very nearing the size of the neutrophils, um, and those would be macrocytic cells. Microcytic cells would be the ones that are really small. And that particular image, and you guys may be getting to the point now where you're recognizing it, that particular image on the lower left is from a patient with immune-mediated hemolytic anemia, and those small microcytic cells are actually spherocytes. And we'll talk more about that in a couple weeks, I think, but those may look familiar to you. So it can be difficult to decide whether or not your patient has a microcytic issue or a macrocytic issue, more often than not, what you're going to be seeing is anisocytosis, with the exception of some very particular types of anemias, um, where you might see a, a complete microcytic um, population, um, and we'll talk about those when we get to our anemia section. So here we have our side-by-side -side normocytic and microcytic. And when we look at those microcytic ones, again, we do see some variation. There is some anisocytosis there, but the primary, if you look primarily, most of those red blood cells are smaller than they should be. Most of those are going to be microcytic. And then the next one with our anisocytosis and our macrocytic cells. And again, if we're let's look at the macrocytic um, size for for a minute, slide for a minute. And I apologize, my my pointer isn't working properly. But if you look at the the top of the screen, there are two top left. There are two um, red blood cells that have decent central pallor, and I would say that those are really normal sized cells. So then look throughout the rest of that image, and you'll see that the majority of those cells are really large, um, much larger than they should be. You've got a handful of normal cells that look like they have normal central power, but the rest of them look really big, and so we could call that a macrocytic sample. Whereas on the left side here, we've got just everything is a different shape, it seems, and a different size. Um, and so those are anisocytic, or anisocytosis. So in addition to um, size, microcytic, macrocytic, and isocytic, we're also going to talk about color. So again, on the left here, I've got um, that normal image of uh, canine red blood cells. And then we're going to have um, some other options for color. Uh, all the way over to the right, you can see those cells are really pale. They have a really big central pallor. Those cells are going to be called hypochromic, and I apologize, my little hypochromic tag isn't where it's supposed to be, um, but those are the ones all the way over to the right. The ones in the middle are considered well-filled, and, you know, honestly, it's we don't use that a ton. Those cells that, that those arrows are pointing at are spherocytes. Those are, those are abnormal cells to begin with. Um, so generally, we're going to be using normochromic or hypochromic. Um, to describe the cells that we're seeing. We rarely will use well-filled in real life. Um, it's just not what we will see. Well, there are other problems to talk about besides it being well-filled. I'm not too worried about that for these uh, red blood cells.
And then we're also going to talk about color. Um, so we're going to have, if we have a normal um, uh, cell, we're going to call it normal chromic, like I said in the last slide. If we have multiple different colors, we're going to call that polychromasia, polychromic or polychromasia. And that's when we typically will include large red blood cells that have a bit of a bluish tint. And um, when we start to talk about uh, immature red blood cells or maturation of red blood cells, the cell right before the mature red blood cell is called a polychromatophil or a reticulocyte. Um, and that polychromatophil is it's got more, um, it picks up more blue stain. And so it's gonna be a little bit um, more purpley than the typical pink or red red blood cells. Um, and that's polychromasia. And then finally, the last cell type that we're going to talk about is the platelets. And platelets are these little cell fragments that help to clot our blood. Um, you can see in these, these images here, there are all those little um, basophilic purple staining um, kind of fuzzy edged cells, uh, cell fragments, I should say. They're going to be smaller than your uh, red blood cells in general, uh, except in a cat. Sometimes we'll get some really big ones in a cat. I like to show off. Um, it's really common for platelets to clump and again especially in the cat. If we look at this image on the left you can see some red blood cells kind of sticking together a little bit in lines. That's called Rouleau. We'll talk about that more um, at another time. Um, but that's kind of one of the hallmarks of cat blood is they like to stack up in little coin stacks like that. Uh, horses like to do that too even more. But uh, the reason I like this slide is because it's showing the clumping of the platelets. So those little purple platelets all clumped up. And you always want to make sure that you're looking out at the feathered edge. Um, when you're doing a uh, blood smear, you're going to start out at the feathered edge. Just scan out there and see, do you have a ton of platelets that are clumping out there? Do you have a ton of white blood cells that are clumping out there? Um, and if you do, uh, keep that in mind as you go and you look at the monolayer, um, which is where all the cells are not touching each other, um, to do your differential. So for the most part, dogs are going to have platelets that are about the same size and shape of each other. And then cats will have, again, this pleomorphic, um, which means they'll be different sizes and different shapes. And that is very, very normal for the cat. Um, and again, the platelets generally will clump easier. And that clumping can sometimes confuse the, um, uh, the hematology machines that we use. Um, and they might actually get red as red as white blood cells. And so the hematology machine, especially the one in the clinic here on campus, um, really likes to read cat platelet clumps as white blood cells and give us really high values. So again, that's one of the many, many reasons why reading a blood smear is so important um, from a technician standpoint. So our platelets have um, some really important functions. Number one is clotting, blood clotting. So whenever we have any abnormalities or um, disruption in the endothelial layer of the blood vessels, and the endothelial layer is the most inner layer of the blood vessel, veins and arteries, um, whenever that's disrupted, that's going to stimulate some um, availability of, of collagen to kind of come up and and stick into the bloodstream and uh, that's going to start to grab platelets and those platelets are going to become sticky and they're going to attract more platelets and they're going to provide this really nice base for a clot to develop. Um, there's more that will happen in order to um, continue the coagulation profile or excuse me coagulation cascade but the first part of it is uh, platelet aggregation. They're going to help preserve capillary walls um, especially if there's ever an opening or um, any damage to the capillaries. And they're going to prevent, uh, or excuse me, they're going to transport substances that are necessary for clotting and constriction and dilation of the blood vessels. So platelets really have one major function, um, unlike the white blood cells that uh, do a whole bunch of different things. Um, they're just going to uh, stick together and create little plugs for any kind of damage in the uh, lining of the blood vessels. 
And I think that is all that we have for today. Um, that just is a nice, hopefully not terribly long, about 40 minutes overview of white blood cells. See you next time.